background is very simple. I came here as an immigrant. Uh, my father was a prisoner of war in the United States, and uh, we came to North Dakota, which probably was the greatest culture shock of my life, but I graduated from the university there, and uh, as a result, I, I had the privilege, since I had no money or anything else, to eventually go to Harvard Medical School. And I trained in that system, and I lived in that system until 2006. I was a resident, chief resident, fellow, and finally department chief and program director. I was uh, someone who, you know, didn't drink water. Uh, Germans are not known for their water consumption. Uh, we're, we're, we prefer other more, you know, tasty drinks. And uh, it turns out I operated on this man who, for uh, fate or whatever reason, happened to be a student at the University of North Dakota at the same time that I was, but we didn't know each other. He had a large aortic aneurysm. I fixed it and uh, wanted him to stick around uh, town. He lived in Las Vegas, and so he stayed at my house. He brought this machine, and I said, but what is this? He said, well, it's, Doc, it's water. It's good for you. I said, okay. So I drank it, and to my surprise, I liked it. I mean, uh, it, instant like, and I can't tell you why, except I think it didn't give you that sloshy feeling. It just... You know, it went down as easy as a beer. Uh, now, when, when you tell me that something is good for you, etc., I need to know why. And uh, I read the Japanese uh, literature uh, that you could download from the internet, and I read a whole bunch of other things that I could download through uh, the usual, the NIH, and so on. And I sort of formulated my own thoughts about it. And I think they are still evolving. And as, as I gain more insight, I will keep adding them so that I can share them with you. Now, I call it the three noble truths of Kangen. A little bit Buddhist influence there. But in any case, alkalinity. The importance of alkalinity has always been uh, emphasized by Otto Heinrich Warburg, and uh, it's interesting, uh, this, this man has become one of my great heroes because this is a man who, A, he never married, he never missed a day's work in his life. He's a man who said there's only one way in which you should miss work, and that's death. Uh, he was an, an extraordinary swordsman. He was in the cavalry in World War I, and it's thanks to uh, Albert Einstein that he returned to research and did what he did. You know he won the Nobel Prize uh, for his development of not just the theory, but the metabolic pathway of cancer cells. Now, cancer uh, lives in an acid environment. Acid environments don't create cancer. It's the other way around but it lives in an acid environment because it can ferment glucose as opposed to oxidizing it. Now, the alkalinity also uh, of the water also has a profound effect on uh, the outside part, our gastrointestinal tract. Lots of uh, harmful uh, materials are neutralized by it. Warburg I don't know how, anyway, on, on, on the right-hand side, you see the normal pathway of oxidative phosphorylation of a cell. And this requires glucose and, requires, uh, and produces a large amount of energy. And that energy is uh, used as ATP. It runs everything in our body. Without ATP, your cells don't work, your muscles don't contract, your nerves don't conduct. And so this is the fuel, this is the bio biological fuel. And in that process, pyruvate and then lactic acid is produced. But our circulatory system can uh, dispense of that, as does our respiratory tract. So uh, a pH is the single most guarded variable within our body. Uh, tumor cells, on the other hand, you'll notice on the other side, produce very little energy and very little ATP, but they don't need oxygen. 
And because of that, they can replicate at will and basically kill you by overwhelming your body with the number of cells. And remember, it is a, it's a logarithmic progression. So by the time you have 256 cells, it just shoots up very, very quickly. And depending upon uh, the type of cancer, type of tumor, it will depend upon how fast the metabolism occurs. Now, one of the single most important proof that the alkalinity is something that really gets into your body it was just recently done in 2009. Uh, animal model was created that produced profound metabolic acidosis. Now, we're talking about a pH that's around 7.36 normally, and when it reaches 7.2, uh, you're profoundly acidotic, and if it goes lower than that, uh, you'll die. And in this animal model, what they did, they gave these animals orally alkalized, ionized water, or they injected it into the peritoneal cavity like you would for peritoneal dialysis, and the reversal of the acidosis was virtually instant. Compared to standard treatment with sodium bicarbonate and so on, this is absolutely profound. Now, micro... Thank you. The next truth is that of microclustering. A regular water molecule, they say, has 15 to 16 units per atom... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 15 to 16 atoms per cluster. However, it's true that in nature this can vary from two atoms to 256 atoms, depending upon temperature and what type of water you have. Now, we say that kangen water is microclustered, and therefore it gets into the cell better. Now, what's the proof for that? One is surface tension. If you try to take, well, just try, just take a glass of water, fill it to the top, regular water will have a meniscus, and the water will actually be higher than the rim of the glass. Try that with kangen water. Doesn't happen. Take a little spider that can walk on water. Put him on top of 9.5 kangen water. Drowns like a rat. <laughs> Surface tension then indicates that the molecular structure has to be different. So by inference, you can say, it's different, and most likely the molecules are smaller. But then you can do nuclear magnetic resonance, and the resonance of the uh, atoms between each other will be a reflection of how many there are in a group. In uh, tap water, it resonates at 130 hertz, and in so-called micro water or ionized water, alkaline around pH 9, 62 hertz. That would indicate that it is at least uh, the molecules or the aggregation of molecules are at least half or less than ordinary water. And that's provable and it's, it's incontrovertible, it's true. Now, aquaporins are entities that the cell has which allow water to get into the cell. Obviously, you have to be able to get it there. And water is unique in the human body in that the diffusion of water into the cell is passive. There's no transport mechanism. So the aquaporins are fixed in size. They are a gene, they are RNA coils, and they also probably have a role to play in type 1 diabetes and other uh, illnesses. But Peter uh, Agre and Roderick McKinnon got the Nobel Prize for this. And this, uh, oh, sorry, this uh, uh, is Peter Agre's uh, Nobel Prize certificate in Swedish. And that little cartoon shows the water molecules going through this cell. And I thought that was rather clever. And here's just another way in which you look at the cell membrane and these smaller molecules going through much more easily, whereas the others are kept out. So microclustering is real. You can prove it exists. 
and it has a benefit because clearly it's like throwing you know, a golf ball or a tennis ball at a chain link fence. More golf balls will go through than ten tennis balls. So this, this is the genesis of that. And then the third noble truth is antioxidant properties. Now, uh, I don't think anybody in this room thinks that uh, antioxidants uh, are bad or, or, or don't exist. The, the proof of their efficacy is ubiquitous. It's all over the literature. The issue about the ionized water, Kangen water specifically, is that it has such a profoundly high antioxidant property. Antioxidants occur in you know, fruits, vegetables, etc., but nowhere near to the extent that uh, they occur in Kangen water. Now, we measure antioxidant uh, or oxidant properties by the redox potential, or ORP. If it's a negative number, you can say it's the good guys because they can donate an electron to free radicals which are positively charged. So when, when you have uh, free radicals coming about, what they do is they set up a chain reaction of cellular damage. The cellular damage starts by eroding the lining of the cell. The lining of the cell or the, the, an artery or the intestine or whatever is then bare and it needs to heal. And it's the healing process that gets us into trouble because when this raw surface occurs, clots, platelets, and all kinds of scavenger cells get there to heal it and in the process deposit cholesterol, fatty acids, and other things. And we call that a plaque in the case of an artery. And as time progresses, if this process is unchecked, it just gets progressively worse. The next thing you know, you have greater than 50% luminal diameter reduction and flow alterations. And then you have things like claudication in your legs because you can't get enough blood to the muscle, or a heart attack, or a stroke. Here we have the ORP, you're all familiar with that chart, uh, it's, it's redundant. Uh, but antioxidants come into play, and many, many have asked me about this, and uh, I uh, we're going to tell you that antioxidants are good for you, for people, for any condition across the board. The traditional point of view of uh, uh, many, many, many oncologists and hematologists was that when you give antioxidants, you will interfere with chemotherapy because the drugs will not be as effective. And that is out the window. It is just not true. There's a review article in Science Daily. and. <clears throat> The review article reviews 850 peer-reviewed publications that show that giving antioxidants does not impede cancer therapy. In fact, there's a slight bias on a favorable note for it, specifically in things like ovarian cancer. So <clears throat> when uh, your client says to you, my doctor said, my, I'm chemo, my doctor says I can't have antioxidants, tell the doctor to, you know, update the literature or update his reading, and uh, <clears throat> it's what we should be doing anyway. Now, my next topic is switching gears a little bit because <clears throat> I want to make sure everyone understands that there is no contraindication to drinking Congan water, just as there is no contraindication to drinking any water for any condition or for any human Ill ailment. There are, however, cautions, and there are cautions not related to the water, but to the volume of the water. And there are conditions that you must be careful in advising the client. You must be careful that you don't do any harm. And these conditions are congestive heart failure, chronic renal failure, and chronic obstructive lung disease, a few rare others, but this is, this is the meat of it. If you are in congestive heart failure, which most commonly in this country is due to uh, coronary disease, 
valvular heart disease and then cardiomyopathy, <clears throat> viral or otherwise, and of chronic lung disease, and sometimes excessive fluid administration, but uh, let's, let's uh, make the point that the heart muscle is weakened so that it is an ineffective pump. Normally, when the ventricle contracts, 65% of that blood gets shot down into your arterial circulation. That's called the ejection fraction, and that's normal. When you get down to 30%, the, the, the heart's in trouble because it results in relatively less blood flow to the tissues, and mechanisms are set up that tend to retain water to help augment that flow. And eventually, as the heart dilates further, the fluid backs up into the lung and the patient is in fulminant heart failure. This is an x-ray of somebody in pulmonary edema or acute congestive heart failure. What you notice is that the heart is very large. It should be half that size normally. And you see these fluffy shadows all over the lung fields. That's water, that's liquid outside of the lung or within the lung parenchyma, thus impeding oxygenation. So you can see how lethal that would be if you didn't reverse it. Here's just an illustration about the pressure in the ventricles that result in uh, good function versus ineffective function. Now, the rationale for restricting fluid is that it decreases the blood volume and therefore the workload of the heart. It improves the oxygenation, it improves uh, perfusion of all tissues, and exercise tolerance. Needless to say, you, you've got to add other medications that strengthen the heart. Traditionally, it was, you know, Foxglove, Digitalis. In uh, 1535, Harvey showed the effect of it. So uh, there are things that will strengthen the heart, but this r uh, fluid restriction makes total and common sense, and it, uh, you know, it's free. And on top of everything else, it works. Now, in obstructive lung disease, the picture is very similar, except the uh, heart right side, which is the pulmonary circulation, which takes the venous blood from your body and then shunts it through the lungs to be oxygenated and then back to the other side of the heart, that is the problem because of damage to the lung. The lung gets damaged in this country, Europe, smoking, number one, and industrial gases, coal uh, dust, asbestos, you name it. Pretty soon, the resistance to flow in the lung is dramatically increased, and the workload of the right ventricle increases. Remember, the right-sided circulation of the heart is a low pressure system, so that a blood pressure of about 40 is normal. You get about 55 or higher, you get pulmonary hypertension, and that produces the same effect that the fluid backs up and eventually accumulates in the lung. Pulmonary edema ensues, and if you don't reverse it, it's deadly. Uh, just an illustration of some of uh, the, the, the effects and the various things that cause uh, heart failure or right heart failure or core pulmonale. And then renal failure. Well, very common. Most commonly secondary to diabetes. Uncontrolled high blood pressure, vascular disease, infections like pyelonephritis, glomerulonephritis, some hereditary diseases, and obstruction like even from uh, benign prostatic disease. But what happens is that the causes of the kidney failure, be they on the arterial side, be they within the kidney, be they within the outflow tract of the kidney, result in the inability of the kidney to excrete all the accumulated poisons of metabolism, specifically creatinine from muscle metabolism, specifically uric acid from uh, other cellular metabolism. And what happens, we get into a state that's called uremia. And the uh, uremia may result in end-stage renal disease. That is, 
when the kidney can filter only a limited amount of blood and these products back up to the point that they become toxic and poisonous. And what you need to do with that is you need to reverse it. And that's either done by dialysis or by a kidney transplant. Now, as these people progress in the severity of their disease, they have one of two things happening. They may make a lot of urine that is worthless, it's dilute, in which case giving water is not an issue, but that's extremely rare. Most of these folk can't make enough urine. They make two, three hundred cc's a day, so if they drink three and a half liters of uh, water, they basically drown themselves, and that's an important uh, consideration when you deal with kidney patients. This is what an end-stage kidney looks like, and it is not a pretty sight. Now, I have a few recommendations and, uh, you know, take them for what they're worth. Uh, they're things that I think are important, and the most important thing, I believe, is that you understand what does this person that you are, you know, negotiating the deal about buying a machine expect from the machine, and are these expectations realistic? You know, if they uh, come to you and they've had, uh, you know, a chronic illness, hereditary, uh, whatever, for years and years on end. Uh, don't say they're going to be cured by conged water. They're not. But it is permissible to say, look, you know, there's no downside to it. It certainly can't hurt you. And there are many reported cases where it's been extremely beneficial. That way, you don't upset the company. That way, you don't get the FTC involved. And most importantly, you're telling the truth. Now, uh, medical advice is probably best given by medical professionals. And I, I'm, not, I'm not talking just MDs. A professional with a license who's been trained, let them give the advice. Uh, also, don't treat the water as a medication. Above all, you know, Dave Carpenter has said that 150 times. Above all, it's water. You know, it's not uh, something else. It's special, but above all, it's water. And cancer cures. Uh, it, 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 there are some unconscionable claims being made because they are not substantiated with anything. When, when you say stage four cancer, it is a totally meaningless term. There are 1,804 different cancers. In, uh, in uh, diagnosed, and each one has a different biologic effect. And stage four indicates that solid, at least one solid organ like the lung, the liver, or the brain is involved. And believe me, uh, uh, that would be rare. Also keep in mind, there are a number of cancers like renal cell carcinoma and melanoma that have spontaneous rem remissions. One day they're gone with nothing, with no treatment. So. You have to put it in the correct perspective. I also think that uh, you, you want to really focus on wellness. You want to focus on, you know, you're going to feel better, and focus on the fact that the ingestion of the water is associated almost always with a change in lifestyle. People drink the water, they feel better, they suddenly think, well, gee, you know, there's something to that. Let, let's see if I can't stop eating the bacon, you know, and the grease and this, that, and the other thing. A uh, few less burgers, and they eat better, and they're healthier, they lose weight. And I think that's a real important thing to emphasize. Know about the alkalinity, know about the microclustering and the antioxidant powers. And call, ask, when in doubt. I, I'm pretty good about answering emails. I'm pretty good about answering calls. So. Uh, hopefully I'll get some help. And finally, uh, know your competition. Do some research on, on these other uh, machines. You know, they, one, one company, I think, out of Korea puts out 11 or 12 different brands uh, machines, which are all the same machine. And uh, when you look at it, uh, they, they, there's no doubt. I mean, this is inferior product. It's just plain inferior. If you're selling the Enagic, SD501, you're selling a Cadillac, you know, not a Yugo. So, there you go. Now, <clears throat> the, 
This water is not a scam. This is the best water the human body can ingest. And the company called Enagic is an honorable, impeccably clean company that makes the best machine of the planet. And show that to your prospects. Finally, Kangen Water Technology and its efficacy is well founded in scientific principles. There's solid evidence available with well done studies in the literature about the efficacy of the water. Kangen Water and Enagic Technology are the gold standard in the industry, and we must all keep it that way. And finally, as Albert Einstein says, Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Thank you.